Şimdi ikinci oturumumuzun ilk sunumunu yapmak üzere Infinitum Genel Müdürü Kijel Olav Maldum'u Norveç Depozite Sistemi ve en iyi döngüsel ekonomi örneğini bize anlatması için kürsüye davet ediyorum. Okay. Thank you and hello everybody. Uh... I hope you had a nice lunch, at least I had. Uh, so I see if I managed to get your attention. Yes, uh, the clicker here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And as I experienced uh, so far today, I think I'm talking to all the people that actually are in favor of the deposit system. Uh, I will talk about how we do the operation in Norway and share some of our experience so we can use that in your process. And it's interesting because you already decided that you want to have a deposit system. Now is the process to say how can you achieve the efficient deposit system. And I also think it's very interesting to hear that you focus on the resources. I come back to that as well. Uh, Infinitum, that's the company in Norway that uh, are responsible for the deposit system for Cansen PT. It's a private owned, and we like to call it a value chain company. It's for non-for-profit, non but it's easy to be non-profit because you can increase the cost. But we have to reduce the cost. We have to make it the most cost efficient as possible because we are owned by the retailer and producer. Uh, it's owned 50-50 by the producer and retailer. The operation for Infintum started in May 1999, but in Norway we have had the deposit system since 1902. So we have had the deposit system all along. And back then, I think that goes for all country around the world. Then you have a take-back system because you had glass bottle and it was important, they were so expensive. So you need to take them back, wash them and reuse them. So everyone had that come back to the development. Uh, we are 5.5 million inhabitants in Norway, 1.2 billion cans and PT bottles in 2018, 22,000 tonne of PT. Today we could supply the Norwegian market with 80% recycled content in all bottles. That's based on the collection rate and the yield in the recycling process. And that's important. 80% is what we can put back into the bottle. But do we have 80%? No, we have around 10%. And the reason is cheaper to buy virgin material than to buy recycled plastic. That's why EU had set the legislation and said we need 30%, at least as a start. I think it's much too low, but I know it's a problem in a lot of market, but it should go much higher because the environmental impact by reused material is very, very high, very, very good. 9,000 tonne of aluminium, and that's recycled in uh, Norway. We are now setting up a recycling plant in Norway for the PET, so we will recycle both the PET and aluminium in Norway. Worldwide, 8 million tons of plastic end up in the oceans each year. It's eaten by wildlife and it's in our food chain. But in Norway, the deposit works. Surfers have seen the evidence pile up. Most bottles come from abroad. So we have two Norwegian bottles and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen non Norwegian bottles. Where waste has value, there's less litter. People also understand the other aspect of it. You know that you're actually only borrowing the bottle. You're, you're buying the content, but you're borrowing the bottle, and you have to give it back, uh, because that's resources. Financial incentives can clean up the environment. Putting 5p on plastic bags reduced the number of being washed up on Britain's beaches by 40%. Sm this guy, he's a surfer, and he's one of our ambassadors. Uh, we use him, he travel around and talk to young people and explain what they can do to achieve a reduced environmental impact. This is important. As you saw, this was a film from Sky News. This was sent on Sky News in January 2017. Up to then, I think all the producers around the world, there was against the deposit system. But I was in a conference in Edinburgh in uh, late 2016 and uh, the journalist come to me and asked, okay, we heard about you have a deposit system, maybe we would like to visit you. Later uh, in 2016, she called me and asked, do you know what's happened with a bottle that we throw on the ground in UK when they go into the Thames and where, goes, where do the bottle goes? And I said, yes, actually we know because this guy, he is surfing on the west coast of Norway 
and in the beach, they have been picking up all, everything that they found on the beach for many years. So we have sort and collect and register all the different bottles and found out that seven out of eight bottles come from our neighbors. It's following the currents in the Atlantic from UK, France, and up to the Norwegian coast. So we are really in favor that our neighbors will going to set up a deposit system as well, because as you all know, the marine littering is also a huge topic. It's a big problem and maybe the biggest problem, all plastic will end up in the ocean at some point, and that's not good for the nature. I stated we had deposit systems since 1902 in Norway. In 19, early 1990, we set up a new deposit system owned 100% by the producer for the refillable bottles. But then you had the uh, development for the packaging industry. You say, okay, now we can use, uh, produce a PT bottle. It's so little material, so we don't need to take it back. It's cheaper to produce a new one. So then around the world, most of the countries say, okay, we don't need to take back the empties. So they started to inform the consumer, it's no deposit, no return. And I think that's the big disaster regarding this packaging. Back in time, we took care of the packaging, and then we educated people for decades and said, okay, we don't need to take back these entries because we only produce new ones. That's not the way to handle resources. But this has been the development. And then we see from 2017 when Sky News had this... Uh, uh, film, they focused on the marine littering, and then we see a total different discussion about what can we do to get back the, uh, the material, the empties from the can and PET and glass bottles and so on. Uh, we have had a lot of visitors. I know some of you have already visited us in Norway as well. And we learned, so we set up some uh, key questions. Uh, and we say, first of all, what's the problem? Is it a littering problem or is it a re resource problem? Should we take care of the resources? And when I hear the presentation that start today, the representative from the environmental department, they already focus on resources. And I think that's very important because if you want to set up a system to take care of the resources, you solve the littering problem. If you try to set up a system to solve the littering problem, you still have the problem what to do with the collected material. So we will solve two problems when you focus on the resources because this valuable material it has to be re recycled and when you set up a system for that, then you will solve the littering problem. If you agree that uh, the resources is the focus, we have to take care of the resources, the material, valuable material. What's the collection rate? How can we collect most of the material? How can we achieve highest possible collection rate? And then, what's the yield in the collection system? how much of the bottle collected can actually be reused as a new bottle. For our system in Fintum, 98% of the bottle will go back in the market as a new bottle. 2% losses in the recycling process when you have a deposit system and good control of what you take into the system. For Infinitum, we have a very strict control. We have to approve everything that comes into the system. So the producer has to send us the bottles. We check the label, the glue material, the cap material, the uh, sealing in the cap, if they have that. And then we check everything and say, OK, this is in appliance with the EPBP or our, in, uh, our uh, approval. And actually, we have a much more strict approval than the EPBP have in Europe. And we had this because we would like to earn as much money as possible by selling the PET, and then we can do that with high, good control of the material we take into the system. So that's a yield in the system. And then, of course, we are owned by the producer and retailer. We are a value chain company. We have to do a job. We have to take back the empties and take the responsibility, the producer responsibility, on behalf of our members. Then, of course, they are interesting. What's the cost per unit? The cost for our operation is the cost for the consumer. The producer cost is the consumer cost. How can we lower the cost for the collection of the material? These questions are important. <coughs> this one special setup in Norway. As I said, Infintum actually is the third company for deposit in Norway when you shift it from refillable to non-refillable PET and cans. And the, what's happened in Norway, and I think this is important because a lot of people say that the industry will solve this. I'm not agreeing that. I think the politicians have to solve it. The politicians have to make good decisions. Then the industry will solve it, but the politicians have to point out the direction and tell what you want to achieve. In Norway, they did that by setting up an uh, environmental cost model. They said if you are selling a product and you can't prove any collection, then you have to pay a tax, a very high tax per unit. This is in euro. 
make a point here, yeah. So we see here is 10,000 euro per ton. That's the cost if you are selling PET bottle and don't have any collection system. So this environmental cost model was enforced in Norway. The industry had the system for refillable, but they said we would like to uh, give people in Norway the possibility to drink soft drink and beer from cans and from one-way PET bottle. What should we do? They looked into different system, visit our neighbors and say, okay, to have the right documentation of the collection rate, then we need to set up a system that they can document the collection. When we report above 95% collection rate, the environmental cost is zero. So that's the economic incentive. The regulation in Norway, the public regulation for the policy system is a one-pager. And it's only the regulation with the tax, environmental cost model, and then the system for reporting, accurate reporting of what we collect. That's important. Rest is up to the industry. So Infinitum can decide what type of product we would like to take into the system, what type of packaging material we would like to take into the system. We can develop based on what's happening in the market. The politician had already said the most important part, you have to collect everything. If you do that, then the environmental cost will go down to zero. So I think this is a very interesting way to solve the discussion about how to establish the system. Good political decision and let the industry solve the problem. We are talking about EPR, extended producer responsibility. We already claim that they have the responsibility. Okay, give them the possibility to take the responsibility and to make an efficient system. Yeah, right button, that helps. So for Infinitum, it's a 100% producer responsibility system. We cover all the costs. So when they sell a product, they already approved, so they are allowed to put a deposit mark on the bottle. Then the consumer empty the bottle, put it into a deposit uh, RVM, reverse vending machine, or go to a small kiosk or corner shop without the reverse vending machine, but take back manually. Then we have the logistic, the shop prepare in the bags. We have the pickup, the logistic cost. Uh, we do the sorting, bailing, and then we ship the material to the recycler and get the income from sales of the material. The material is feasible to reuse in the bottle and the cans. And then you have the closed loop, the circular economy. And the reason why we have this is because of this environmental cost model. So the political decision, make the industry make the solution for the collection. Now we are working together with the industry in Norway, so we also tell the politician, can you please enforce a cost model for, re for using virgin material? Because as I pointed out, there's one problem with the plastic, it's cheaper to produce virgin plastic than to use recycled plastic, even if the environmental impact and the resource efficiency is very high when you come to recycling for plastic aluminium, it's very high but it's not included in the, in the environmental cost is not included in the, uh, the product. So now we work with a model and say, okay, if you are selling a bottle with zero content recycled, then you should pay uh, uh, a cost. If you have 100% recycled bottle, then it's go down to zero. So it's the same principle and the environmental cost, but it's for the use of the recycled. Some problem with the text. Yeah. Okay, uh, and because we have this environmental cost model in Norway, uh, Infinitum haven't got the monopoly. Because in Norway, they say to the industry, you can set up whatever type of system you want, but you have to prove what you document, or prove what you sell, and what you take back from the market. So in Norway, we had a competition between the different collection systems. So you can choose to put a can into the curbside system, be a member of the curbside system, uh, you can choose to be a member of the Green Dot with a PET bottle without deposit mark. But Green Dot, they report 88% collection rate. Uh, the curbside, they have around 70% collection. Infintum have above 95% documented total collection rate. So for the producer, it's cheaper to be a member of Infinitum compared to the other system. So it's a voluntary system, but it's more costly to choose the other one because it pollutes the pays principle. They have less collection rate, less uh, value of the material, don't take care of the material in the same way as they do in the deposit system. Therefore, all the producers want to become a member of Infinitum. We also had a system for refillable. For 15 years, 
from 1999 to 2015, the two systems, the two companies were running in parallel. So for the consumer, there was no difference if you bought a bottle, a refillable bottle or a non-refillable PET, you go to the same reverse vending machine and deposit and get your money back. But the system for refillable was shut down in 2015 in Norway. And the reason is it's much more costly for the producer to run the refillable compared to the non-refillable system. And also we had done a lot of studies when it comes to the resource and environmental impact. So this is more efficient with a recyclable material. That's the setup in Norway. So we have to compete with especially the green dot system. So we have to be more cost efficient. If we are not, then the producer will choose to go to the green dot instead. And we beat them by higher collection rate and better quality on the material and lower cost per unit compared to the green dot. So it's cheaper for the producer to be a member of green dot no, uh, infinitum, compared to the green dot. <clears throat> okay, something about logistic and production, how we run the operation in Norway. This is the map uh, in Norway, 5.5 million, so it's a few Norwegian, uh, but we have a long distance, it's 3,000 kilometers from uh, south to north, uh, so the population is spread out widely. So we have three production plants where we take out the volume from the market, we sort, Aluminium from uh, PET, we separate uh, PET into clear bottle, light blue bottle and colored bottle. And this we do to increase the income from the sales of the material and then we ship it to the recycler. Uh, the setup is if you have a reverse vending machine, then you use a plastic bag, a half pallet size or a full pallet size plastic bag. So inside the reverse vending machine, this register first the barcode and they control the shape on the, um, on the bottle or can to uh, secure that it's a right product. Then it's compacted into this bag, Oi. compacted into this plastic bag. And you can see we have around 3,700 grocery stores in Norway with the reverse vending machine. It represents 94% of the collected volume. So most of the sales is going back to the grocery store with the reverse vending man. But in Norway, the legislation pointed out that if you are selling a product with deposit mark, you are obliged to take back. Even if you are a small corner shop or a gasoline station, we think that's a good solution. Because if you turn around and ask yourself, what can, what can you do to give the best service to the consumer, make it easy to get rid of the empties? So if you buy a small bottle in the corner shop, then you know that you can actually go back to the shop and deposit. And in Norway, you have to take all type of products. So even if you are a corner shop only selling PET bottle, you are also obliged to take back a can, Coke can for instance, or a beer can for that sake. So you don't divide in products, make it easy for the consumer to deliver back. And then it's important for the shop to have an efficient, easy system. So we allow the shop uh, corner shop, gasoline station, tourist huts up in the mountain, they can commingle can and PET into the same bag. We pick up when they have one bag, we will pick it up. So we have a high frequency on the logistics and that's important to give good service to the, to the small shops. We also have a solution with, uh, for the e-commerce. Yeah, that's a better picture. So that's a 50 liter bag. And based on the regulation in Norway stated that if you are selling a product with deposit mark, you are obliged to take back. If you are an e-commerce company and you deliver the grocery and the beverage on the doorstep, then you are obliged to take back the empties from the doorstep. And then the consumer, they can put empties in this bag, 50 liter, fill it up, and the e-commerce company, they will take the bag back to their logistic hub. We will pick it up. We will read and register all the units in the bag and we pay out to the e-commerce, then the e-commerce pay out or reduce the cost next time the customer buy new grocery on, on the internet. For us, this has been a very efficient and a, uh, interesting uh, solution to set up. In the, when we started the discussion, the e-commerce was a little bit reluctant and said, okay, I'm not sure if you really want this, but we said clearly the regulation is clear, you have to do it. And then they certainly found out that this is very good because then when you can take the empties back from the household, then there's no reason for their customer to go to the shop to buy anything because everything happened on the doorstep. So they think this is a good idea. As you can see still, the volume in Norway is very small. It's around 1% of the total sales, but it's increasing slowly. 
Um, and we think that that will be a bigger part of the solution in the future. But it's very cost efficient since the truck are already there at the household and they take it back. So it's efficient way to collect it. So this is how we do the setup. It's rather simple. If you, have a, if you sell some product, you are obliged to take it back. And we also stated that as long as one person lives somewhere and managed to buy some grocery and beverage, we can take back the empties. There's no reason to say that you can't take it, even if it's a small island with only a few families. We will manage to take it back because there is already trucks there delivering. And as long as you manage to have a delivery, you know the volume for take back is less than delivery. So we have an overcapacity for the take backs. So that's not the issue at all if we look into the logistics. And that's important because if we want all the small outlets to be a part and to love the system, you have to give them good service, and good service means high frequency on the logistics. This is additional solution on the go, and of course there's a big difference. There's a lot of discussion what to put into the deposit system. We claim it's very important to think where is the packaging sold. We know for beverage, Packaging, a lot of the sales are on the go. You buy it in a kiosk or a gasoline station, you go into the park, you sit there in the summertime, and then you don't bother to go back to the, to the kiosk. Then we have made the solution. So first you have this for the garbage bin. Instead of putting the empties inside the bin, you can put it outside, and then someone will pick it up. And it's interesting because this will never be filled up. When you establish this solution, then someone will take responsibility for the area and say, okay, this is my garbage bin. So they will pick it up and go and deposit. So then we get in the volume there. Then we also found out high school, university and so on was a lot of empties that's going to the garbage bin. And the reason is that they buy energy drink or something and um, have that for lunch. And then they don't have the possibility to deposit, so they throw it in the garbage bin. So then they, we made this solution with actually old oil barrels that's refurbished. And the school and university, they buy it. The student, they give the empty to the school. And normally it's the student organization that then run the operation. They have to take out the bag with the, uh, filled up with empties, tag it, and then our logistic partner will pick it up from the university. And we pay out the money to the university, the student organization. So this is also rolling out now. And it's very positive because we, Infinitum, have the possibility to get some messages to young people and use our company name. And we see the feedback is very positive. And they say, okay, now I can put it in the uh, deposit drum instead of into the garbage bin. That's very efficient. Uh, key figures. I think also it's important, as I mentioned, if you are going to focus on the resources, how can you achieve highest possible collection rate? And this I found very interesting to discuss because now we see country by country, they have to admit that the collection rate that's from the Green Dot system, they are much too high. The reporting are not accurate at all. Actually, last week I heard on the radio there was a discussion, so even Sweden said that, okay, we have a problem to reach the new EU target because when we look into the figure, it's actually lower than we have been reporting for a long time. And this goes for a lot of countries, Belgium, UK, yeah, I think all countries around Europe, they have to admit that the figures are too high. I'll show you later on why. But for Infinitum, we appreciate the new regulation because we are counting by units. So we count every bottle on the barcode and the shape into the RVM. So we also go public with the total sales for the market. What's possible to deposit, that's the 100% that's going to the market. And that's the collection rate through the RVM. That's what we call the deposit uh, collection and then also in Norway we have to report what's collected through the household garbage and we get uh, that reporting into our figures so in total we therefore can report about 95 percent there is a proposal from the authority to say they don't want to allow energy recovery for PET bottle or cans so that will be taken out of the equation and we support that fully because you should not burn the PET if you look into the environmental impact by burning PET, then you have the CO2 emission, and also you lose, lose the resources you use to convert oil or gas into plastic. So you should never ever burn a PET bottle. Actually, if you have a bottle, a lot of people say you can burn it because it's made of oil, but it's only 20% of the energy in the bottle is from the oil itself. 80% of the energy in the bottle, that's the uh, energy used to convert 
oil into plastic. If you incinerate the bottle, then you lose the 80%. That's not the way to handle resources. Therefore, you should have the material recovery recycling. So this is the total reporting. Um, yeah. And we think this, so we have gone public with this for the last six, seven years because we saw the development and saw, okay, there is a lot of other systems claiming very high collection rate. And we was asking ourselves, how can they achieve that high collection rate, 95, 96%? But it's not possible to check the figures. So we said, okay, at least we will go public with our figures so everyone can check our figures. And I, that's, I think that's important. Uh, in 2018, we increased the deposit value in Norway. So we see now we are up to 88.7%. And now we are up in 88.9%. So it's still increasing. So the end of this year, I promise that we are above 90% collection for both CAN and BET. So we reached, reached the EU target 10 years ahead. And I can supply the producer and import in Norway with 80-90% collect, uh, recycled content in the products. As I mentioned, the reporting, this is what's been reported from the Greenland system. And that's, as Clarissa pointed out earlier today, no EU has stated that they would like to measure what's actually coming into the recycling process after you clean the washed material. And this is important, first of all, because then we will suddenly see that the deposit system actually have a higher collection rate compared to other systems, because when the other systems start to wash their product, they will have a huge drop in the collection rate. And as you see here, you double to triple the weight on a product when you have residues from the food inside. And that's been the big problem in Europe. All the country reported on tonnage, and I'm pretty sure they knew about this here, but it was not interesting to discuss it. But now when EU have set a new target and a new way of measurement, the discussion about that, we think is really important. Because if we are focused on the resources, we have to find out how much are we able to collect from the market and how much of what we collect can we put back into the market as new products. Uh, as I stated the fourth point on the, the question list, I said what's the cost for the producer? Cost for the producer is cost for the consumer. So this is what we call the EPR cost, what the producer has to pay for us to take the responsibility for the product. If you have a basis that if you have an aluminum can or a clear PET bottle or HTP bottle, this is the cost. And as you can see now, we actually pay the producer to put cans into the system because it's very cost efficient with an aluminum can, a good prices, uh, an aluminum can. And then we will have a period now that we actually can pay the uh, producer for putting the can into the system. And then we have additional costs if you use light blue bottle, if you use colored bottle, or if you put a sleeve or label on uh, the cans, then you have to pay additional costs. And the principle for this cost model is the polluter pay. If you have a high quality material, lower cost, if you do something with the packaging, it's still recyclable, we will take it in, but you will inflict in the pricing, the income from Infinitum, so then you have to cover the dividends. Yeah. This is a slide I got from, um, I think it was Croatia, I did a study to look into different systems. So here they compare the cost uh, for the different system, and as you can see here, Norway is a very high cost country, but still we managed actually to run the system very cost efficient. And for us this is important to prove it's actually cost efficient and it's possible. Because for many, many years, a lot of people claim that if you set up a deposit system, it will be very costly. But it's not, not need to be that if you do it in the right way, I set up in a cost-efficient way. And that's why we think the Norwegian model is rather interesting, because the politicians have decided what they want to achieve, highest possible collection rate, and then the industry would like to reach the highest possible collection rate, but they want to do it for the lowest cost possible. So then we have the best side from, or the best situation for both the politician and for the industry. Because the industry are very good at innovating and making good solution as long as they know which direction they should go. We also pay the handling fee. So the shop, we cover all the costs for the shop the area, the workforce, the packaging, the investment in the RVM. We heard a lot of discussion about it's very costly to buy an RVM. Yes, costly, but you invest in the RVM as you invest in everything else as you have in the shop. 
In Norway, it's up to the shop to decide. They buy, rent, or own the REM. It's not in Fintum. So we pay the handling fee. So then the shop can decide when or if they would like to have a reverse vending machine. So it's up to them to decide. And we think that's a good solution because then if you buy something and you own it, then you also will take care of it because it's your property and you will like to run it as efficient as possible. Yeah. This is the setup. So in Norway, we have a centralized organization for Infintum. All our members, they have to report a sales figure every month from the producer and importer here. And then we have, um, they sell the product to the retailer, distributor, then you sell it to the shop, shop sell it to the consumer, the consumer deliver back the empties, then you have the return rate. And then we pay out the deposit and the handling fee to the shop every 14 days. So we get all the data from the REM or the manual bag, bag is taken into our uh, industrial uh, recycling plant where we count up and then we pay out so they get the money every 14 days. Then we pick up the, the goods from the shop. We have the cost for the logistics and then we <coughs> sell it to the recycler and it's going back into the market as new products. So that's a circular economy model. And we stated with Norwegian model, we have a circular model, but we would like to give the Norwegian producer and the importer the possibility to use all the Norwegian material because that's much more efficient than Norway spreading the volume out in Europe. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Both in Turkish. Uh, I talk about uh, plastic gives the DRS the lowest carbon footprint and the highest reuse capability. And I think that's important. That goes both for plastic and for um, metal as well. Can you see? Have the sound. An empty bottle is full of energy, enough to use a tennis ball machine for more than an hour. I like this film because if you are looking at YouTube, you have to be 18 years to look at it. So <laughs> that's the Americans. Uh, this is one of seven different commercials we have made. And the statement here that you can run a tennis ball machine for one hour, that's the difference between putting a PET bottle into the garbage bin and send it to energy recovery or put it into a DRS, to a reverse vending machine, for material recovery. That's the saving of the energy for one bottle, one liter bottle. And this we do to educate, because we get a lot of questions from young people. They ask, okay, we deposit, we understand that's good uh, when we think about the littering, but what's actually happening with the bottle? So then we have to start to educate them and say, okay, we have made four different LCA studies for the PET and the metal to actually find out what the total effect is when you run a deposit system. And then we can use the figure here to educate what's happening if you deposit a can or PET, what's the total saving for the value chain uh, when you put it into a reverse vending machine compared to uh, energy recovery. And this is from uh, one of the reports for the PET. And here you see the difference. If you are producing PET to sell 1,000 liters of water or some kind of product with zero content of recycled, and then you see the green one, that's when you start to put the recycled content. We could supply 80% today, and then you see a reduction from 123 kilograms CO2 emission per 1,000 liter of uh, product down to 31. It's a huge difference. And that's interesting when you look into the figure for PET, it's a very efficient material regarding recovery, recycling. And you can put the material back into the loop. And that's also important because this was the first study for the LCA where we also include the production and running of the reverse vending machine. Because a lot of people said, if you set up a deposit system, you have to produce a reverse vending machine, then you won't save anything. But then you see the impact from the reverse vending machine is very low. And also we see to the transport. <coughs> In this uh, report, we also 
had a steering committee with a representative from the Green Dot in Norway and also for the biggest municipality central sorting plant in Norway. So they was joining in this project for this LCI study. So here we would like to compare what's the impact when you have a deposit system or if you have a Green Dot system with 70% or 50% uh, collection rate. Then you can see the figures for the uh, effect of the incineration, the transport, uh, the reverse vending machine and the total. And then you can see, for instance, for the transport is uh, half the emission from uh, a reverse vending machine or a deposit system compared to the green dot. So you just reduce the impact from transport if you set up a DRS system compared to the green dot system because people do the job to take back the empties to the shop and so on. So we think this is also important because at least in Norway, we have to shut down the center of Oslo during the winter or some days during the winter because of the emission from the diesel trucks. Then we know it's important to reduce the amount of trucks on the road. And we know the filling rate uh, for the trucks in Norway, I think that goes for most of Europe, is around 50%. So we have to make it more efficient. And then it's important to see what can we do to reduce the need of transport. So this is in the report as well. And this is important. Uh, <coughs> this is also a comparison because in Norway we have a wine monopoly. Uh, if you are going to buy wine or spirit, then you have to go to the monopoly to buy it. They made the LCA study in the same way as we have done for the PET and the cans. They did that on uh, wine and they found out that the um, environmental impact for a bottle of wine, 40% was represented by the glass bottle itself. So in Norway, the wine monopoly now say that the wine producer, they have to shift from glass bottle to PET bottle with deposit. And it's always interesting to tell this to the French guys, that they have to put the wine in the PET bottle. But that's interesting because they did it from a resource and the environmental impact analyze and see, okay, what's the effect? So here you see the comparison when you are selling 1,000 liter. This is the CO2 emission for glass, bag in box, carton, uh, PET, 100% recycled PET or for cans. And we think this is also important. We will never get rid of the glass bottle. It's important to use glass bottle because it's a very good quality packaging for some product, but it's not the volume uh, packaging. So this is uh, also what you can achieve when you have a deposit. You have very good figures and you can look into all the different data. Last slide, summing up. Uh, so in Norway, the system is voluntary for the producer and importer. Uh, we have this environmental cost model. So the legislation in Norway is very short, very brief. It's only stated that you have to document what you collect and then you will reduce the environmental cost. Based on this environmental cost model, we have an open market. It's competition between the different collection systems. So as long as you report and the authority, we report once a year, the authority will look into the figure. And then we see that the producer, they want to join the deposit system because that gives the lowest cost per unit. We have the regulation stated return to all points of sale of packaging, including in the deposit scheme. All points of sales have a duty to accept reasonable quantity of empty packaging. Because we got a lot of questions, what will happen if you come with a big garbage bag full of empties going into a small corner shop? But that never happened because the consumer, they are aware if you have one bottle, you go into the corner shop. If you have a garbage bag full of empties, you go into the big uh, grocery store with a reverse vending machine. So that's not the problem. The consumer is actually rather reasonable. In Norway, we don't have the deposit on the VAT. In the Scandinavian, most of the other countries, they have VAT on the deposit. We don't have it in Norway. I think that's more reasonable because the deposit is actually the consumer's money. So when they deliver back the empty, they get back their money. It's not a sale. And it's not a product price. Uh, at the point of sale, the product is labeled with a product uh, price plus deposit. We think that's important. It's stated earlier today as well. Because in some countries, you have the discussion and say, OK, if you set up a deposit system, it will be more costly for the consumer. I already showed you the actual cost, the total cost for the consumer if you buy a PET a bottle in Norway. But the deposit is not a cost as long as you deliver back. So you borrow the, you buy the product, but you borrow the packaging and you have to deliver it back. If you don't do that, we take the money and we reduce the cost for all the other that's actually the deposit. The shop, they can decide if they would like to invest in an RVM. It's an easy calculation. They have to look into the volume. How much can I expect to get uh, from empties? 
and then I will invest in an RVM when we see we have an increase in the volume. You think that's a good model because then you don't need to invest in an RVM uh, on day one. You can do it step by step and you see that you have an increase. Uh, in Fintum, we are on behalf of our members responsible for yearly reporting on the deposit rate and the collection rate. So the deposit rate is what's collected and registered through the RVM and the collection rate that's include what's coming through the household garbage. Of course, we would like to get everything out of the household garbage and into the reverse vending machine. And we see most of the people, they deposit, but we have some people, I think around 10%, they don't bother with any type of system, if it's uh, sorting uh, at home or something. So we have to work with the, those people. Uh, Infintum can decide the extension and development of the system. So based on this environmental cost model, it's up to the industry and Infinitum to see, okay, what can we do next? So for instance, the solution with the e-commerce, that was initiative from Infintum. We said, we would like to make a solution for this new way of uh, shopping. So we can do that. We also allow milk products uh, in the deposit system, uh, but you are not allowed to put milk on a PET or you can do it if you have a clear PET, but not a white PET bottle. If you would like to use a white bottle, you have to use an HTP bottle, but then you are allowed in the deposit system with the deposit mark. So this is kind of decision we can make in Norway. And I know my colleagues in the other Scandinavian country, they don't have the same possibility because a lot of this is regulated in the law. And as we saw earlier today, in Germany, they don't have juice. In Norway, we have concentrate, we have juices, nectars, everything is in the deposit system because the producer wants to join the system because it's lower cost based on the environmental cost model. Okay, that was about Infinitum, the deposit system in Norway. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>